Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 575. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 17th of February, 2020. All right, welcome to another program. Yeah, I know, we all look like we're in a different spot. Okay, George's got the nice white shirt. Gavin has a scarf. He had a, a little Russian uh, hat on a little minute ago that looked really cute. And uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and we're here to perform Anglican Unscripted for you. It's a new show we uh, try to record twice a week where we give you the news around the communion, around the church, around the world. Uh, before we get started, you as faithful viewers, and we love you, all of you, I mean, every one of you we love very much, can help the program by clicking the like button on Facebook or YouTube. It's that little thumb thing. You click on that. Subscribe to the program. If you're not subscribed yet, you click on the red rectangle and then the bell next to it. If you're not willing to sit and look at our faces, we have a podcast. You can listen to us on the car radio, on the way to work, however you want to do it. Just listen and get your news from Anglican Unscripted before we get too far down the road. Gavin, you're back in the uh, the uh, Ashton Cathedral there. <laughs> it's, it's now an oratory, Kevin. But <laughs> <laughs> Downgraded. <laughs> Downgraded. Along with me, we've both been downgraded and we are we are clothed in the virtues of Christian humility, both the, the building and I. Yeah, but it's quite cold out here. So um, uh, hence the hat and the scarf and the steaming cup of tea. On the other hand, my, my heart is on fire. So what does it matter that the flesh is, is assailed by, by variations in temperature? <laughs> it, we have the variation. Right now in Florida, it's probably 70 humid again, right? Yes, and uh, right now the pollen is out. All the oak pollen, the fruit oh. trees, grapefruit, oranges. So mm -hmm. the cars are all covered with yellow dust and spring is just starting the leaves are turning coming out the buds are coming out and and if you well news weather and sports every That's half right. hour on Anglican <laughs> well let's move to news and then i want to have a big philosophical talk about the the future of the church uh online uh on the internet uh n news broke uh, right before we after we finished our last episode that Harry Miller, the police officer who was investigated by the police for having thought things or tweeted things outside of uh, the what they thought the norm was, he was investigated and told he had not committed a crime, but he would be noted in his file that he had committed a hate crime that did not exist. He went to court and won. Uh, give us a quick update on that, George, and then Gavin and I and you will talk about uh, how this is a big win. Miller is a retired policeman from the north of England who made a uh, tweet, uh, made a private comment uh, on a, he's not a public figure by any means, he responded and and he was investigated, I believe, I believe it was the Humberside Police Department who investigated him for a non-crime hate speech. And they had officers come by and told him that uh, you need to check your thinking that uh, you are thinking bad thoughts and we've got you down in our books uh, for basically committing a non-criminal offense. Turns out that there are over 120,000 police investigations in England and Wales for these non-criminal hate uh, speech uh, complaints. And uh, Miller took it to court saying this is a, this, the police should not be investigating non-criminal acts and that I have a perfect right to tweet what I want, how I want, when I want, so long as it doesn't con convene, contravene any existing laws. And you tell me it doesn't, yet you're investigating me anyway. And this went to the courts, and really in a surprise judgment, the, uh, the court ruled that uh, the police had acted unlawfully, unconscionably, unconsciously, unconsciously, and the judge uh, likened them to the Stasi or to the uh, NKVD, of basically seeking to monitor the thoughts of citizens uh, rather than uh, police true crime. And it was a remarkable victory uh, for free speech, freedom of thought, free expression for free Englishmen uh, in the face of almost a decade of further tightening and erosion of civil liberties. And that's what's been happening, uh, Gavin, 
over time in Europe, you know, this uh, Marxist culturism has slowly been overtaking baby steps at times and then big steps at others. And I did not foresee the court uh, coming down on the side of Harry Miller on this. Is this a big Kevin, win or is this is a temporary win? Well, I wish I knew the answer. I don't know. Uh, but it's such an interesting week because uh, there have been two huge wins. We'll come to the other one later, perhaps. But the same thing has happened in Rome. And, and I don't mean to, to take anything away from our present conversation, which we need to continue. But, but Pope Francis has held back single-handed the tsunami of progressive liberal theology that looked like it was about to overwhelm the Catholic Church, constituting a new magisterium. Well, the same thing has happened in England with the criminal law. This single judgment appears to be holding back the tsunami of progressive culture that was going to overwhelm us all. But, but will it? Um, this man retweeted a limerick. It was really quite a funny limerick. Um, and, and as George quite rightly said, the police logged a hate crime, which wasn't a crime. And the problem with logging them is that if, uh, although you've not been convicted of anything, they turn up on searches that employers make about your social profile. It, it turns up that the police have had to speak to you to check your thinking. Now, now, the problem I have here, and I don't know the answer, I mean, I guess in the comments we may have some far more competent people, perhaps even some lawyers who can help. Um, although case law is effective and, and, and sets a new precedent, against the case law we have, uh, we've had five years of the training of police, teachers, probation workers, doctors, um, all, all the forces of the state have been retrained by Stonewall, uh, which is a, a very large gay LGBT lobbying, the LGBT lobbying in industry here, which has enormous sums of money at its disposal, given by government and by other agencies. So all that's happened at the moment is um, that the thinking, the, so the thinking of, of, of professionals out there has been changed. The, po the police won't stop thinking you've created a, ha a hate crime. I think what it means is that if you choose to take them to the courts and you can find £200,000 to do it, you'll be able to look to the precedent of Mr. Miller and say, you should treat me no differently. But I think that, I, I fear that's all it means. I suspect the police will still continue to do it until citizens say stop this and let's let's take this particular instance to the courts in other words i don't believe it's it's capable of doing more than temporarily halting the tsunami of cultural change and giving those who can afford it access to a piece of precedent well this doesn't stop the cancel society and the the storms that happen on twitter and other places like facebook where there's just a, a violent reaction to people's thought and where they will get them fired or they'll get them suspended from school or they will uh, get them to commit suicide. This is just police checking your thought. This doesn't affect all the 99% uh, of all the other bad stuff that's happening out there. This is one small uh, legal challenge that they want in court uh, to stop the police from checking your thought. Twitter and Facebook and all that are still horrid places uh, to be a conservative or orthodox or Christian uh, or a Christian or a government official who believed these things for 10 years, 10 years ago. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. That's my view too. And I realize that some people will think I'm, I'm, I'm over uh, capable of being histrionic or apocalyptic. But uh, um, I mean, for example, we've had a public suicide in the last 48 hours, a, a celebrity uh, woman who was on a program called Love Island, which I've, I've never seen, and uh, she won Strictly Come Dancing, which I've seldom seen, but but she she was a, a a very serious celebrity, and she was going to be prosecuted for a domestic crime. She she hit her boyfriend over the head with a table lamp. Um, the police turned up. <laughs> you have this extraordinary conjunction where he's been he's saying in the, in the papers today we had this wonderful thing between us and. In, in the next door column, the police saying when we turned up, they were completely covered in blood, and it, you know, we we thought murder was being done. If that's the completely beautiful thing, then then uh, it's a different scale from us. But the point of it was, Douglas Murray, I think, wrote something saying, uh, no, it was sorry, it was a a, um, a correspondent in the Telegraph, and he said something very profound. He was a he's a Christian called Tim, sorry, Tim Stanley, 
And he said, what we've done is we've replaced God with the social media. And the thing about God was he came with justice and mercy. But the social media who are now our God, the, the, who look at us and judge us and keep a record of all our misdoings, the, the judgment of social media is harsh and there is no mercy. And this, this is an enormously important theological point, because I think in terms of our evangelism, what we should be doing is to say, Jesus will save you with, with judgment and mercy. But, but Facebook, Twitter, your friends and your online relationships will send you to hell and they may even cause you to take your life. So well, we need to fix our it, evangelism. To, it, goes to, to one, it goes one step further. Twitter and Facebook and online media uh, the online society does not know how to forgive. Even if you make a mistake and you say, I'm sorry, I won't do it again, I'll go to your retraining camps, whatever it takes, I'm sorry. No, you're still getting canceled, you're still getting fired, you will still never work again, and uh, you, you would please them very much if you just committed suicide and left the face of the earth. There is no forgiveness online. The, the Miller case in England speaks to, is, is for me symbolic of the, the disconnect between the elites and the, uh, the masses, for want of a better word. Uh, the, the police in the United States, the police in the UK, the upper echelons are so thoroughly corrupted by politically correct thought. And another way, we have the, the McCabe case of the FBI, where the upper echelons of the FBI were thoroughly corrupted. As are the as are the upper echelons of the Justice Department, whereas the rank and file police officers, the mm -hmm. rank and file FBI agents, are doing a wonderful job, doing a faithful job, sticking it out, and knowing full well that the the, the creature that only two people rise to the top of a cliff: eagles and lizards. Uh, and lizards are what we have at the top of the cliffs these days in the church, in the police force, the United States military. Uh, to become a general officer these days, um, there's a under the especially under the Obama administration, there was a tremendous disconnect between the actual war fighting soldiers and the pencil pushers who are promoted because they espouse the latest correct social doctrines. Which takes us straight to the We see this, in the, we see this in the church, we see this in the military, we see this in the police, we see this in the government, that there are a, an unaccountable elite that are hold views and uh, that are diametrically opposed to those whom they're allegedly called to serve. All right, let's think, trans, well, I think it's a good point. We have a lot to talk about. I wanna transition here to the Amazon. And that, that's why Miller got in trouble because of the <laughs> yeah, transition. We're gonna do the <laughs> sort of transition. Yeah, let's transition to the Amazon. Okay, a uh, Pope uh, Francis has re recently put out a statement uh, about all the topics that occurred in the Amazon. And I remember when we talked about uh, the Amazon Synod, you could see uh, sweat bullets forming on Gavin's head as <laughs> what was slowly uh, transpiring down there. And George and I were just, we weren't smitten with glee, but we're like, you know, the Roman Catholic Church is going to go the same way as Anglicanism, the same way as the Episcopal Church, the same way as uh, Protestantism. It's it's not too far off. Been Pope there. Francis, with the uh, influence I'm thinking of Pope Benedict, is holding the line. George, what's the story? Well, we don't know the story, but we know what's been publicly reported. Mm -hmm. The Francis uh, released last Wednesday an exhortation of, uh, uh, following the Amazon Synod, and Francis was silent on two recommendations put forward by the Synod Fathers, uh, women deacons and married local priests. This was a surprise because the left of the Catholic, the left wing of the Catholic Church, the Brazilians and the Germans and the Austrians and so forth, have been pushing very hard uh, for a change on the rules of celibacy, a change on the on the role of women in the ministry, and the and the thinking was that Francis, who's an ally of this group, was going to go along with it. C Cardinal Sarah, who is from uh, Ivory Coast, I believe, or Guinea, Guinea, or Guinea, get well, he's from West Africa, uh, and wrote a book with uh, Pope Benedict. Uh, where they defended celibacy, 
and the internal uh, scuttlebutt articles that we read was that uh, Francis basically came to a point where he really was this the was this the time to uh, reform or change the magisterium of the church in, in what would be in essence an irrevocable decision. And so instead of saying, and so Francis was silent on these issues. He didn't say no directly, but he reaffirmed traditional teaching. Now, what this means is that the conservatives are overjoyed. It's a, they've dodged a bullet, but the liberals, especially Cardinal Marx, the president of the German Catholic Bishops Conference said, this changes nothing. Uh, we're still going to afford because we've been told we've not been told we can't do this so my episcopal church analogy still holds whenever the liberals have defeat they don't accept defeat they keep moving forward you've got to drive a stake in the heart of a liberal to stop him it, just because the pope says no doesn't mean the germans are going to stop so the germans are going to start this synod and they're going to talk about women priests they're going to talk about married priests and they may do something locally they're threatening but from a macro picture, the Catholic Church is saved from a traditionalist worldview. From the liberals, we just lost this battle, but the war's not over. Gavin, how are you feeling? <laughs> has it has Roman Catholicism been saved? Has Pope Francis uh, given enough uh, uh, protection to the conservatives by not speaking on this? Has he actually spoken his mind, or is he... Uh, just going along with the program here. Upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So we see that working itself out rather beautifully in time at the moment. I don't think anyone quite, as George has wisely said, no one really knows. Um, the mystery here is, is Pope Francis. Uh, in one sense, the danger was that he was going to develop the magisterium in a non-consultative way, uh, in, a, in a way that one couldn't ignore, but that was going to provide a platform for progressive culture news. Um, there was one thing George missed out, if I may say so. So you're, you're right, he, he, didn't, uh, he didn't give a platform for local married priests, nor to, um, uh, nor, nor to, the, to the ordination of women as deacons. But, but perhaps more importantly, he also didn't give a platform to syncretism. So one of the things that the Amazonian Synod had brought in was the whole Pacamama thing uh, and the, the, the ghastliness of the assumption that somehow the Holy Spirit was at work in all indigenous spirituality. Whereas for most of us as Christians, we would say the other spirit was at work in most indigenous spirituality. This is such an, a, a hugely important theological shift that it was a Trojan horse smuggling in serious relativism and, 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 and the demonic and diabolic into the Christian tradition. So a great deal hung on this. We don't know why Pope Francis didn't build on the machinations of those who organized the Synod, who, as George said, were very were, were proponents of the progressive scheme, but he didn't. And the fact the church has never done so, and that the Pope also has never done so, um, means that that particular train has the brakes fully applied. And so uh, for as much as some German bishops and theologians want to make the church as Protestant as Luther did in the 1520s, it's going to be very much harder for them to do it. I, I have asked, and I've been reading with some interest as much as I can to get myself up to speed, that I think the most interesting thing that somebody has said is that... Um, is that the Pope Francis is, is essentially a Peronist. And what that means is that, that within South America, uh, Peron managed as, as, a, as a kind of dictator by, by taking an attitude to power that involved saying to the people you were speaking to whatever you thought they wanted to hear in order to give yourself some space to then pull together the strings of your agenda, having lulled them into quiescent quiescent tolerance uh, and that that Francis as as Jorge Bergoglio grew up and was completely immersed in this as a as a culture and absorbed it to, to, to the depth of his bones and therefore in a way if we treat him as if he were a German theologian and a German theologian like Ratzinger would say well this is what I'm saying and I mean it 
<laughs> you could you could depend upon the fact that I mean what I say. You could measure it, test it, turn it upside down, shake it. I still continue to mean what I say. But I don't think Francis does mean what means what he says in that sense. He's a South American Peronist. And and that plays havoc with the idea of magisterium, of course, because if you're gonna have a Pope saying all kinds of things that you think you can then rely on as you build the spirit led Christian tradition, it's going to upset people. And it has upset people a lot. But wonderfully, it looks like the story stops here. It'd be very interesting to know why, whether it was the tears of Cardinal Sarah and Ratzinger or or the Holy Spirit working through some other way. But I'm absolutely thrilled because it it, it means that um, the Catholic Church is doing what I thought it ought to do, which is living and teaching the faith that is 2,000 years old without deviation to a world that's gone mad. And it's the only church that looks like it can do it, apart from some lovely Pentecostals um, who, who aren't as stable as I think they ought to be. <laughs> I don't but, remember, well, I don't remember a time where Pope Benedict would, um, or previous popes were corrected by the uh, press office in Rome in the Vatican as much as Pope Francis has been not corrected, but that's not what he meant. That's not what he meant. He didn't really say that. And that goes to your point about being yeah. raised in, in uh, South America where he was raised and the culture he grew up in. It's not as certain as a German theologian would be. And we see and we see this in practical action in Venezuela, for instance, or Nicaragua. In Venezuela, the Venezuelan Catholic bishops are firmly against the uh, government which has destroyed the country economically. Millions of people are in poverty and it's Venezuela went from being the wealthiest nation in South America in a per capita income to now just above Bolivia. Uh, and the papal and the but the Vatican has not backed the local bishops conference. We had the same thing in Nicaragua, where the mark the semi Marxist government, uh, Daniel Ortega, yes, he's still around after all these years, is uh, essentially persecuting the church. Priests are being beaten up, masses are being disrupted by government thugs. The local Catholic bishop conference is uh, pushing for democracy and transparency. And yet the Vatican does nothing. And in other words, and it yet it curries favor with the state. So this double-mindedness, uh, which is not, which is not the tradition of the Catholic uh, Church, uh, in its political actions, this double-mindedness that Francis uh, has exhibited, uh, when Francis visited uh, uh, Bolivia, he uh, Evo Morales, the president, gave him this little statue of with a hammer and sickle. And it, it made a wonderful photo op and uh, Evo Morales is a semi-pagan and he's trying to bring back Indian spirituality into the life and the Catholic Church is fighting this tooth and nail, as is Raphael Samuel, the Anglican Bishop of Bolivia, who's a friend of this program. So here you have Francis undercutting his local bishops in Bolivia by making nice to the dictator Marxist pagan president. So he, he does, so in other words, he says, to his bishops, he says one thing. To the president of Bolivia, to the president of Venezuela, to the president of Nicaragua, uh, the church is saying, the church in the form of the Vatican and the Francis is saying another thing. I think the biggest the example of this is... South America. I think the biggest example is actually uh, the Chinese-approved bishops of the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, they've lost China. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has lost any influence or any gains made in the last... Uh, uh, 120 years in China. It's gone. Cardinal Zen, the former Archbishop of Hong Kong, uh, recently gave an interview to one of the Catholic periodicals saying that this concordat between the Vatican and Peking uh, gave Peking everything and the Vatican nothing. Mm. We've read stories of uh, faithful Catholic bishops being tossed out of their rectories because, oh, well, we're having a fire inspection and you, uh, you have to leave right now. And, uh, oops, sorry, we have no other place for you. So the clergy is sleeping on the street in these Chinese cities for the crime of not kowtowing to the uh, uh, Catholic, Catholic, I think it's called the Patriotic Catholic, Catholic, so Catholic Patriotic Association. 
the formal Chinese Catholic Church. Um, the Vatican's not standing up for its people in China, and this is Car Archbishop Zen, Cardinal Zen's uh, cry. Something like this happened in Russia, um, because the, and the reason it's similar is is that, that, that when you're dealing with a, a totalitarian regime, there's not a great deal that a Christian church can do in in negotiating with an implacable foe who's willing to use force at, at any time you want. I mean, I'm not. I, I don't. I, I have no idea what the right course should have been for the Vatican. This seems to be in a terrible course, but but, but what, what is the right course? To set all Catholic churches on a collision course with a totalitarian regime that will have thrown them out of their, their churches anyway, whatever happens. In Russia, for example, you had in the 20, uh, first half of the 20th century constant splitting in the Orthodox Church as groups of Orthodox believers did what the Catholics have done. They went underground as a reaction against the what they saw as a treachery or the compromises of the hierarchy. So I think partly this is a symptom of what, what happens when you deal with um, with a totalitarian regime. But on the other side of the coin, you have the fact that there are in China millions and millions and millions of Catholic Christians, as well as Protestant and charismatic Christians. And it's it's immensely exciting as one looks at the world at the moment. Uh, from, from, from 1989, when I think 0.5 percent of Russians were Christians, uh, in, our, in, our, in our adulthood, something like 73 percent of, of Russians now identify, self-identify as Russian Orthodox. I mean, what an incredible miracle. When you look at the number of, of, of Christians, Catholic and otherwise, in China, the, 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 I wish I had the numbers to hand, but I mean, they're mind-boggling. And then in Africa, there's an enormous growth too, and Islam and, and Christianity are poised in a desperate struggle for supremacy. In Europe, we're going down the tubes. In America, you're waiting to find out. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but, 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 you know, in terms of Christendom, the Holy Spirit is, is, is alive and working enormously powerfully. I, I think the question is for all of us, you know, what is, what is our vocation where God has placed us? Um, and, and, and I think as we face the totalitarianism of cultural Marxism, uh, our vocation is to be as articulate as we can while we have the space, because I don't think we'll have it much longer, which takes us on to one of the questions you're going to ask about how we do it. Yeah, I mean, now, I, now. I, I would say that I, I personally believe we're to, re, we're to place in church life just as the church was in the third or fourth century with the Arian controversy, where it, the, the reform will rise not from the clerisy, but from the faithful people in the pews. Uh, the Episcopal Church, and I'll say it, Gavin, you don't need to respond to this, but the Catholic hierarchy in the United States is just as bad as the Episcopal Church hierarchy. Uh, our local bishop here in Orlando has a reputation for cover-up corruption and being a bit of a, a boy's man. And this is, uh, and against this, we have people in the pews, we have good faithful priests, but they run up against their uh, hierarchy, uh, who are basically adopting a new creed. Um, I one think the the is going to come up, rise from below. One of the interesting things in my, my reading is the discovery that this this pederasty and homosexualization of the Catholic Church is very recent. Uh, it, it, it's, it started in the 60s and 70s. Of course, there were elements of it before that, but, but it, it broke out as a torrent partly in response to Vatican II changing the, the goal lines of doctrine. If you don't know what you're going to believe in doctrinal terms, maybe you don't know what you believe in ethical terms. And if you want to believe other things in ethical terms, you may cut yourself some slack in terms of your personal behavior. And so some of the commentators see this as very much a problem of the second half of the 20th century, not indigenous to the issue of celibacy or the Catholic Church. In fact, apparently the Catholic Church is now the safest place for sexual abuse in the United States. Uh, statistically speaking, they've cleaned their act up. But I agree with George. One of the things that we've seen in the last five years, particularly under Francis, is, is traditional lay Catholics being profoundly stimulated into their witness for the faith and their demands that the faith be kept pure and unsullied as it always was. Now, this wouldn't have happened without the stimulus of Pope Francis and the, and the, the worst elements of Vatican II. And perhaps there are equivalents in other churches too. In other words, it, it's, it's a spiritual principle that you, you know, we have always recognized that God uses suffering in order to prune his church. 
I, I do want to say one thing because I have no first-hand knowledge of what I just said about the bishop in Orlando. Uh, I can only repeat what I have been told by lay Catholics who have come to me, uh, who have been active in the Catholic diocese, who are basically saying, maybe I should join another church. And my answer is, you don't become an Episcopalian because you're pissed at your bishop. You become an Episcopalian because you believe what we're teaching is right. Um, and so I have no, I have no firsthand knowledge, but the conventional wisdom among traditionally minded, active, faithful Catholics whom I have spoken to has been that our hierarchy here, at least here in Florida, is hopelessly corrupt. And Paddy Passu, George, you don't become a Roman Catholic because you're fed up with Anglican liberal bishops. You become mm -hmm. a Roman Catholic because you believe it's true. Yes. So that's absolutely right. That that's the principle. Not not fleeing from from incompetency and human sin because you never stop fleeing otherwise. I'll, I'll still take a pledge card from you, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> transition time. Transition time. I, I We're transitioning. Send you <laughs> time time to transition. Uh, we had a, a pre-show conversation about. For, for lack of better terms, connected. How does the church reach the connected world, the online world, the people who, you know, it, you look at people 25 and younger or 30 and younger, and all they do all day long is this, that their face is on a, a, a seven or eight inch, uh, size, seven or eight inch size screen. And this is their world. This is where they get their input of data. This is where they get their news. This is where they get their friendships. This is how they communicate with people. Um, my kids have a phobia of calling people, even though they have $500 phones. But they will text all day long. They'll sit there and they'll text on their little text apps or WhatsApp or Snapchats or Facebook or Twitter. You know, my kids can literally do you know, 35, 40 words a minute this way. What are you kidding? I'm still, I'm trying to aim my pinky to get it correct. And the, the I and the O are way too close together in the world of iPhones. It works on QWERTY, doesn't work on my iPhone. How does the church, how does the gospel, how do we reach people that are connected all the time? And I read an article back in the early days of AOL when forums and chat groups were starting to to form and this this uh, philosopher type person said you know that's the new front porch you know we used to walk down the street and we talked to you know uh, Harry and Mavis on their front porch and they'd give us some cookies and some biscuits and we'd talk for two or three hours just chewing the chow and talking and we go from porch to porch to porch on weekends and that's how we we got the news and caught up on on family relationships and shared pictures and photo albums and sometimes you know sat around the the radio and listened to uh the news that's that was the 50s that was the uh the 40s that's not there anymore we have a new front porch a new front porch and that's online that's these communities that we we put on our phones and look at the new front porch is facebook it's twitter I, I think a wonderful example of that is I see Gavin and Kevin in the flesh maybe once every five years. And I'm the tallest. You wouldn't know that. <laughs> but uh, I'm almost eight inches taller than Kevin. People think I'm shorter for some reason than Kevin. I'm the editor. <laughs> but, but yet at the same time, I uh, have uh, these two other men in this uh, screen that you're seeing, I have the closest relationship with uh, of any other men in my life right now, yet I don't see them in the flesh, uh, except once every half decade. No, and and that, that's that's becoming normal. It is normal, and it's global. We are having instant communications with a place that is seven hours away by plane, seven hours away to, to Florida, seven hours away to England. And it's instantaneous communication. We can see facial changes. I can, I, I look at a screen with you guys on it when I'm talking to you. So I can know if I'm way off course, Gavin or George will give the stone face. Move on, Kevin. Move on, Kevin. Move on, move on. And that's the magic of what we have here. We have personal relationships provided by digital contact. How does the church reach that? Gavin, okay. you had a online uh, ministry where you, uh, did uh, prayers of the people uh, yes. and morning prayer that reached out and, and people were affected by that but there's a limitation 
The well, limitation the, the, is how do you deliver sacraments? Yes, the um, the Lord doesn't often speak to me. I mean, He speaks to me a great deal through Scripture and through the sacrament, but I don't often hear from Him uh, as as a, sort of like a WhatsApp message. But I did, but I did recently. I was complaining bitterly to Him East, Easter two or three years ago uh, because this guy was this clergyman. Uh, was was preaching this wonderful Easter sermon, and I was saying to the Lord, "Look, this is you know, thank you, this is fantastic, but I can do this too. Why have you rusticated me?" And then I heard him say, "Go and go and preach your sermon online." And then I, I said, "I can't do that. I, I really I can't conceive of preaching a sermon <laughs> into an internet camera. All all my skills for the last thirty five years require something different. Don't, you're you're asking too much. Anyway, this probably isn't you anyway. <laughs> so I I did a I, I did a Moses." Uh, uh, an Abraham thing and said, well, there are 42 people in church here. If if by the end of the week, when I put a sermon on YouTube, you give me 42 viewers, I'll take this as being from you. Uh, so I did that and I, I had 200 by the end of the week. And the numbers don't matter, but but they've they've continued anywhere from between 50 to 1,000, depending on the title of, of the sermon. But so that's not important. What's important is that, and what's utterly, utterly wonderful, is I get quite a lot of emails nowadays. I mean, more a day than I can easily manage. Um, I keep on getting people saying, we, we've picked up this homily or this catechesis of yours, uh, and uh, I'm now a Christian. Or something, the Holy Spirit did, did something really quite wonderful, and they say what it is. And I'm, I'm reduced to tears by this. Because the, the, the unlikelihood of 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 my words in this odd part of the country where I am, reaching somebody and having the explosively salvific effect that only the Holy Spirit can bring. The unlikelihood is so extraordinary, and then to go on repeating it. Now, I I don't have an internet ministry of any size at all. Nothing compared to teenage influences who make a lot of money and have real numbers. But but that that isn't the important. So so the, I want to say two things. One is. Uh, I'm sure the Lord wants this to happen, and I've been encouraging George to put his, who is a most marvelous preacher, one of the very best, to put his sermons online so that people can. And again, it doesn't matter whether we get 200 or 20,000, but um, most, uh, I would say, like you, I, I, I think probably most of my life is is online. The number of people I sit in the pub with and drink beer with and talk face to face is really quite limited and actually I, I I give preference to the online ones because they're much more efficient. I, I'm 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 a bit I'm a bit chary of the it time investment of someone coming to see one personally because it's gonna take up three hours. Well in three hours on the internet you can accomplish a great deal. But um I think this is the way forward in the same way that pornography has utterly utterly taken over the internet and and, and use it for, for Satan's business. We, at the very least, should take what the opportunities God gives us uh, and and use it for his business. The other night, I'll stop in five seconds. The other night I, I began, I discovered a YouTube channel where you could listen to French Catholic bishops give their testimony. And I just binged watched for three hours and bathed in, in the most marvelous act of the Holy Spirit. Some of them were bureaucrats who didn't know Jesus in my estimation, and some of them were men utterly full of the Holy Spirit looking for miracles in their diocese in great power today. But what's out there is fantastic. And I think that those of us who uh, who have got something to offer, whether it's our testimony, whether it's prayers, uh, should, should, should use it because there's a terrible hunger out there, and the church in the West has been so beaten up and knocked sideways. So much of the way the church is done in time and space is done badly, and people need something with a higher octane content to it that the Holy Spirit can provide. Gavin is so right, and it, it's been a question that's been much on my mind, uh, and the it's all coming in different directions. I've hit a plateau at my church in terms of attendance. We've gone from about 135 years ago on an average to 250, an average this last year. But we're at 90 plus percent capacity. And I've added services, but at, and I do now four to five services a weekend because I have a smallish building. And, I, and then I also teach a class. And I do not have the energy to add additional services. And I don't have uh, an assistant. 
So the, and we filmed the uh, we filmed the we filmed the major sermon, and but it's done by a volunteer and it's pretty amateurish. And what I've found is that in the ten thirty service, I'm preaching to a generation that has been raised to look at things in half hour chunks because that's how they watch television. So a twenty eight minute sermon is ideal for them because it is hits exactly their capacity to receive information. My children cannot do that because their capacity to absorb information is so much shorter based upon how they receive information today via Facebook, social. They don't use Facebook. They use all these other things, Instagram and things of that this nature, TikTok and all that. So the attention spans and the ability to com comprehend information is getting shorter uh, with the younger generation. Well, and... So that is one thing that I've been trying to, how do I do, how do I respond to this reality? While at the same time, I get emails from people that make break my heart by saying, I live in the wilds of so-and-so and there's no decent church for me to go to. How can I have fellowship? How can I live out the life that you talk about? How can I be part of a church family that you say is so essential when there is no church family to belong to? Gavin has his answer. Uh, which I'll let Gavin answer. But mine is, I'm thinking, is there a way to do this online? Can you have Christian fellowship online or is it only a form of entertainment or instruction? Can you? Well, see, I'm my... a good Episcopalian in that I have, I use a Calvinist liturgy. I have Catholic sacraments and I'm an Arminian uh, priest. So that's, that's the perfect Episcopalian because I cover all bases, but how can I, reach the spiritual needs of people without being physically there for them i, well, I, I think the, that happen. the biggest question i have is what can't we do on the internet and in terms of being uh, a liturgical guy i can't see us doing sacraments in any way shape or form the eucharist and other sacraments through the internet <clears throat> that's that's gonna be the that's gonna be the big limitation well, you can do pastoral counseling one-on-one -on -one via the internet. And confession. Well, I, that's a sacrament for Gavin, not for gotcha. me. Gotcha. <laughs> I'm going to ask your apologies because I'm going to say something that might be taken as sort of being militantly unpleasant. Um, but, but this was very much in my mind over the last three years. As, as an Anglican bishop, I found myself with people saying, I want to join your church. Uh, I want to belong to your organization. And, and in terms of the internet, we could do that wonderfully, but, but, but I couldn't provide them with the sacraments. And then, then the question arises, do you believe in the sacraments? Now, if, if you don't believe in the sacraments, and there are lots of, there are lots of Christians who don't mind very much. I mean, uh, in all the evangelical youth groups I've ever known, uh, receiving Jesus, the body and blood of Jesus was never very high on, on their spirituality. There are plenty of people for whom it doesn't matter. I once knew two Russian Orthodox nuns on the east, northeast coast of Scotland, uh, sorry, England, who only received communion twice a year. Uh, and I remember talking to them about it in 1982, thinking, well, is this okay? But that, that's what happened. Um, f for me, uh, having discovered that I think the, the Mass is real, uh, I, I want it as often as I can. And, and for those who want the sacraments, I think the answer is you will become Catholics because it doesn't matter how incompetent the clergy are, the miracle of Jesus will happen to you wherever the Mass is celebrated. And this is such an amazing and wonderful thing. And there are so many Catholic churches. Why wouldn't you do it if you want the sacraments? If you don't want the sacraments and what you want is an agape love feast or or some form of, 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 of Zwinglian calendrical remembrance, then, then it doesn't matter because you're not missing very much and you you know it doesn't matter where it happens. But uh, I think we can do all the evangelical stuff fit to bust on the internet and we must and if you want the sacraments then my advice is become a catholic because you'll then get them i want to finish with one last thing which is in the in the sunday newspapers i came across a page devoted to a pagan witch she looked about 22 she was very pretty and they gave a a video inset and they said this woman has more followers than the archbishop of canterbury and the whole of the lambeth and the whole of the whole of the the whole of the christian kind of uh, Anglican scene. I think she had about 230,000 followers and she combined everything from pagan cookery to, 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 to spells of hardcore and softcore kind. And I, I watched her and looked her up and, and I wept because I thought this is really effective, dangerous, damaging stuff. 
the pagans are, are, are perfectly willing to sell their appalling self-help stuff that comes from the other side uh, effectively. And we Christians haven't yet got our act together enough. Although I have to say, thanks to Kevin, this, you know, this actually what we're doing at the moment is a superb example of something that doesn't happen very much. We, we have the opportunity of taking three guys with different skills and talking theology, uh, politics, uh, spirituality, discernment, pilgrimage. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, it's such a privilege to be part of this program because I think what Kevin has set up and what you and George have done together is just magnificent. And, and long may it go on being magnificent. And, and I hope there's all kinds of spin-offs to Anglican Unscripted because this is the way to do things. Well, thank you very much. Um, do you guys want to hit comments real quick? Or we've hit 45 minutes. You want to say no, the comments for Friday? Can we no. book? Can we book George's mathematics professor for next time? Because I think that's such. That an was no. That's great. Uh, uh, oh, actually, this was one of the comments. Uh, okay. This issue arose in conjunction with the comment. I'll just I'll just share it then. Uh, one of the comments uh, was, "How can you? Uh, we have, in essence, two theological worldviews: George and Kevin's and Gavin's. How can you, in integrity, uh, preach and be?" exhibit Christian fellowship when you have, in some areas, diabolic, diabol uh, di diabolical, diabolical, <laughs> diabolical, Kevin has diabolical views, <laughs> diametrically opposing views. In other words, uh, are, are you, are you hypocrites? In other words, are, are, aren't you just doing what Justin Welby is saying, uh, putting unity, being putting joviality and friendship above core principles and for this person? Uh, one of these was justification by faith. The other, he was a tulip fellow, uh, limited atonement, and all, all this good Calvinist stuff. Now, it just so happened yesterday I preached uh, all that was wrong with predestination and uh, outed myself as an Arminian. And after the end of the service, one of my members of the choir, who's a retired mathematics professor from the University of Wisconsin in La Crosse, I think, or one of these frozen places, said, You know, George, uh, if you look at it in from the fifth dimension, predestination only works if you believe the world and God created the world in three dimensions. But in the fifth dimension, time and space are uh, melded together so that predestination can't work if you, uh, it can only work if God is confined to three dimensions. And I went, uh. <laughs> <laughs> He's to, uh which is to correct, by the way. That is a, uh, but, a correct. Uh, my, my, my point being is that I, do not hold myself out as a mathematician by any stretch of the imagination. But I, I don't particularly worry about that. Now, Gavin thinks the, uh, the, the mathematician's answer is spot on theologically. I should uh, I do. I, I'm very excited about this because I've been thinking about it a great deal as I've been finding uh, huge anger on the internet uh, between Catholics and Protestants and a number of of, of evangel I have a lot of friends <laughs> on Facebook and they don't talk and play nicely. They, they play horribly sometimes. Um, and I've been giving a great deal of thought to why it is that I can't explain about Mary and the saints to people with any, any, any intellectual success at all. Um, I think for those who are minded in this way that the are angelic and demonic forces at force uh, uh, working in all of us. I don't think that, that that you can take spiritual clarity for granted ever. I think some of us have occluded sight because of the spiritual battle we're in, but that's that's not something I want to talk about here and now. I was reading a very interesting book called Reformations, and and one of its one of its theses is that there was a great deal of reforming going on in the European Catholic Church in the late 1400s and the 1500s and that what what Luther and Zwingli did was not was not a, a a singular reformation it was one movement amongst very many so why did it happen and and as I've been reading it I I've been thinking gosh the really interesting thing is that the mindset of, of the philosophical mindset which I think I call an enlightenment mind 
and the enlightenment mind is a, is a is an empirical mind it's a it's a mind set as george said in the basic dimensions of what we can see and measure and it, it doesn't like any bending of those dimensions and and therefore it gives itself to calvinism in particular because calvinism is a lot and double predestination is the logical extension of a fairly tightly bound uh, dimensional universe but if if inst what we and what we've as Protestants, those of us who've been brought up as Protestants, we've inherited the Enlightenment mind, which has been tremendously powerful in terms of engineering and science. I mean, it suggests you can rely on things around you to be to be developed in a coherent and a rational way, um, because they will be dependable. But I think there's a Christian mind that predates the Enlightenment mind, and 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 therefore I say this is the Catholic mind and the Orthodox mind too. So the Catholic and the Orthodox have a Christian mind that is that, that goes goes way back, and 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 Protestants have this 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 new four or five hundred year old worldview that doesn't allow for the bending of time and space. It does doesn't, for example, it, it is very uncomfortable with the Transfiguration, which I think is the is a paradigmatic image of of the christian and catholic and orthodox mind and, and i think that the <laughs> some protestants some, some protestants. that's right some. i was gonna say no. hey, you put us all in one big barrel no, um, words, like, i probably but, draw very big lines here i apologize yeah, but we're, we're about to hit 50 minutes here can we no, yeah, let, let me let, let all me right. jump this right down gavin's throat uh <laughs> i contrasted Theodore Beza versus versus the well Wesley, and Wesley, Wesley, yeah. and Wesley is entirely where Gavin is on this, and I don't think anyone would mistake him for a Roman Catholic. Oh no so, no 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 no! You're so wrong. We've got, two, we've got two different within the Protestant world. We have the uh, the the, the hyper Calvinists, if you will, and then we have everybody else who's right thinking. <laughs> no, no. But Wesley, there are obviously exceptions, and I'm, I'm sorry, I drew some very thick lines. I, I, Wesley begins with the Catholic mindset. He begins as a sacramentalist. He becomes a Protestant for reasons I think are entirely functional. Um, I mean, he has to get the church built and revived, and so he can't do it within the Catholic framework. The only the only framework that can be done is the build it yourself Protestant one. I, but, so in, in his case, I think I make an argument of saying that that was a pragmatic, not a philosophical development. But if we go back, and I'm sorry to have been so broad with my sweeps, um, I, I, I still, I can't find a better explanation apart from the spiritual discernment one, that, that what we're dealing here with is, is with a, a an enlightenment mindset where time and space don't bend and they don't get interrupted. And, and a Christian mindset where time and space are completely porous and you would expect the stuff from outside to weave its way in and out, just as we found the angels uh, they're doing in, in, in the Old Testament and in, and in the Gospels. Um, it, the, an, the angelic interventions is, is precisely what I'd expect to find in the, in the Catholic Orthodox Christian pre-Protestant mindset. Shouldn't say and pre right. About time yeah, I would say it was Anglican, not angelic intervention that <laughs> makes this. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, to, to, to keep yeah. it simple for our audience, I believe heaven is going to be full of Protestant laity and Roman Catholic laity. Clergy, I can't, I, I can't, you know, I can't vouch for uh, the clergy. Guys, I want to thank you for watching the program, for uh, staying tuned to a, a 50 minute, not an hour long. Give us a little grace uh, on, you know, what's been happening today and the future of reaching the gospel to the digital world, the connected world. If you guys have any comments on how to reach, uh, the connected world. I would love to see them in our in our comment section. If you have a correction for George and I, or a correction for Gavin, uh, that you want to apply to uh, <clears throat> the last five minutes of our show, that would be wonderful as well. As far as you know, are are we hypocrites? No, we're not hypocrites in any way, shape, or form. We are brothers in Christ. It's it's it, it's Amen. a reality, um, and. Uh, Yes, there, there are doctrinal issues, but because we're brothers in Christ, we can see beyond those. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you and your mindset have been listening to Anglican Unscripted, episode 575. Keep it real, guys. <laughs>